Thank you, guys. Do um, you ever feel like, you know, you, you come in after some things and it's like all you can do is crash it from this point? That's kind of the way I, I feel right now. It's like, wow, this is, God's been here and he's operated and now I have to do something. Anyway, so our, my topic tonight, our topic, we're continuing in our grace series, our Fixer Upper series, and tonight it's Amazing Grace. And I have a, a personal story I'd like to, to tell you about how God operated in my life just in the last week or so. It was actually a week ago Sunday night. We were getting ready for small group, and uh, the doorbell rings, and I open the door. It's, even, it's hard for me to talk about it even now. Um, there's uh, one of my small group members is standing there with a Chicago Bears hat on. And I'm like, Lord, what? Lord, help me, help me. But I must say, you know, it's amazing when God moves through you and allows things to happen that wouldn't just come naturally. And so, you know, he came in and he sat down and I, I smiled at him and talked to him and, and he left with the hat and everything. It didn't make it to the fireplace. So I just encourage you that even when you struggle with things, that God can do great things through you. Wow, okay. Tyler, that's for you. Um, most speakers want you to remember something. I, I'm gonna ask you tonight if you would forget something. So uh, for some of you, forgetting comes naturally. Um, my wife thinks it does for me. Um, but I must say, I, I can't have forgot it if I never heard it. Or if I don't remember hearing it, then I, did I forget it? Anyway, so tonight I wanted you to forget what you know about Jonah. Can you do that? Just for about 15 or 20 minutes, then you can remember it back. So I wanna set the scene for you. Jonah, approximately 750 BC. Jonah's in Nineveh, modern day Iraq. Jonah is a, since you don't know who he is, he's an Old Testament prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. And Nineveh is the largest city in uh, Assyria. Actually, it's the largest city in the world, the capital of Assyria. Assyria was a country that was at war with Israel, at war with Judah, and God kind of used uh, Assyria and the Assyrians to punish the sins of Israel. So now, now that I've kind of set the scene there, right, Jonah and Nineveh, I want to tell you the, the history of Jonah. And I say history instead of story. Sometimes we say story when we're talking about the Bible, and when we say story, sometimes we think once upon a time. But the book of Jonah is a history, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you to the end of Jonah, the fourth chapter, and we're gonna start there. Jonah chapter four, verses one and two. It says, Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God, God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was gonna happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. So I want to ask you tonight, what did Jonah know? He says, God, I knew it. What did Jonah know was going to happen? What made him so angry that he, R-U-N-N-O-F-T? Something. So, Let's flash back. Can you do that for me? All right, it's like a movie. You know, Jonah's stuck there, all right? He's yelling at God. Let's go back in time. So uh, sometime earlier in the kingdom of Israel, God came to Jonah in Jonah chapter one, verse two, and God says to Jonah, get up on your feet, go on your way to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in a bad way, and I can't ignore it any longer. Now, bad way here doesn't mean like, oh, they're in a spot of trouble and we need you to go help them out. They were evil. They were doing evil things. And if you've ever been around evil, you see people get hurt, people get injured, people, they're in a bad way. Now, the text doesn't give us any details of what Jonah was supposed to say, but we know he was, he was a prophet, so he figured out he must know what he, he was supposed to say because... Obviously, he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to say it. He tried to put himself in a position that he couldn't obey. Now, I, I wonder if he was thinking of, of Balaam and 
Barack and, and that whole thing where, you know, he wants to say one thing and he can't. Um, and since you've forgotten the story, um, I'm going to need to explore some possibilities of what Jonah knew. So I'm going to help you out here. Old Testament prophets were only allowed to say what God told them to say. If they did anything else, they were, they were dead. God killed them or the people killed them. Nineveh, again, is not part of Israel. It was not part of the chosen people. They were not in the covenant of God. The Assyrians were the enemies of Israel. They came in, they killed people, they destroyed things, and they stole everything else. So basically, God tells Jonah, go and warn them that I'm gonna destroy them. Now, Nineveh, if we, if we look at it, is totally deserving of destruction. They are... Um, evil, they're outside the kingdom of God, so their actions and their lack of relationship puts them at risk. Now, when I think of the Old Testament and I think of wickedness, I think of things like Noah and the flood. Anybody know that story? How about the Tower of Babel? I know what God said to Abraham. He said, the cries of the victims of Sodom and Gomorrah are deafening, and the sin of those cities is immense. Um, I know what happened to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The city of Jericho, the entire land of Canaan. So when I think about this, I think it seems pretty straightforward to me. God is calling Jonah to go to Nineveh, tell them you're gonna be destroyed, they're gonna get destroyed. So what put Jonah so out of his mind that he would run from God? I don't think it's fear because he was a prophet to the, to the northern kingdom of Israel and those dudes, were they were bad. So he's constantly preaching against sin, putting his life at risk. So I don't think going to Nineveh, I don't think that's what he was afraid of, uh, of physical harm. I think, um, what, what did he know? He went to the furthest possible destination he could find. Now, I don't know if that's because he's thinking, well, they're going to be destroyed in 40 days, so if I go 41 days away, I can't do anything. I don't know. So let's, let's fast forward, since I can't figure it out and you can't remember. Let's fast forward over the fish incident, okay? Anybody know the fish incident? I know you forgot that part, but let me just say about that. If Jesus believes it, I believe it. So Jonah is spit out on dry land, and he's in Nineveh, and he's preaching that they're gonna be destroyed in 40 days. Seems to me like that's kind of what's expected, right? Evil people outside the faith are gonna get punished. Sounds like the Old Testament. The people who hurt God's people are gonna get hurt. Makes, makes sense, I think. So what did Jonah know? Don't you wish he could remember? Thanks for forgetting, by the way. He knew it at such a level that he ran away from God. At such a level, he risked his life. And uh, truthfully, I mean, he should have died. I think he thought he was going to die because, you know, he could have said, hey, turn the boat around, take me back to Israel, everything will be okay. But he said, throw me overboard. So let's go back to our opening scene because I want to know what Jonah knew. So back to Jonah, chapter four, verses one and two. Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God, God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was gonna happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. Verse two, I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. This is what Jonah knew. At such a level that he risked his life. Imagine yelling at God, God, I knew you were full of grace and mercy. God, I knew you're not easily angered. God, you're so rich in love, you're ready to forgive. That's who God is. Jonah knew it. He knew that God forgives. Do we know that? We know that, right? God forgives. 
He knew that God would forgive the wicked. We believe that, right? I mean, that happens. Jonah knew that God would even forgive outsiders. We think that can happen, right? I mean, we've heard of it, right? Jonah knew that even if they didn't do it right, now, if you think about it, if you, if you go back to the story, they, the children of Israel were required to offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. They offered it at the temple through the priests. These guys in Nineveh, they fasted and prayed and they, they dressed in sackcloth, right? They made their animals fast and they dressed their animals in sackcloth. So just imagine like the chickens and the pigs and the horses and the donkeys wearing clothes, okay? This is how they repented. They didn't even do it right. But it says, God relented. He saw what they did and he relented. That, to me, is amazing. They didn't have to do it the religious way and God forgave them. I like what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, verses four and five. He says, it's a wonder that God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy, with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. Jonah knew that God's grace was amazing. Our fear is that God's looking for a way to get us. When realistically, he's looking for a way to save us, a way to forgive us. Jonah, God sent Jonah away from the chosen people, away from the people under his blessing, under his covenant. Romans 5, 6 says, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. That's me. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Colossians 2, 13 says, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive. Ephesians 2, 4 says, it's by grace you have been saved. Ephesians 2, 8 says, it's by grace you have been saved. Separate scriptures, God's repeating himself. Through faith, and this not of yourselves, it's the gift of God so that no one can boast. What if we all lived what Jonah knows, what Jonah knew? What if my mindset was such that I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt, risking my life on the fact that God is sheer grace and mercy? that he's not easily angered, that he's rich in love, that he's ready to forgive even the worst of people. And that not only that, but he does forgive, even if they're outsiders, even if they don't know how it works. Do you know you can be forgiven outside of this sanctuary? Just checking. What, how would this impact the way we lived if we believed God was all grace and all mercy and wanted to save people? I want to challenge you tonight because in going through this, I believe that there are four types of people in our minds. And the, the first type is the people we expect to be saved. And what I mean by that is, I'll, I'll give you an example, my kids, right? I expect my children to be saved because I'm their discipler. I'm responsible. So I have, a, I have a feeling, I have a pretty good feeling, a confidence that I'm gonna do whatever it takes to bring them into the kingdom of heaven. Then the second group of people is the people we hope will be saved. Now that might be, you know, your brother-in-law, your mother-in-law, I don't know, maybe your family in some sort. And then there's, there's a, a third group of people, people that maybe we doubt will be saved. 
You get those people? It's like, mm, your boss, maybe? You know, too many self-employed people here, I guess. Um, <laughs> and then number four would be people we don't want to be saved. Maybe that's your ex. Maybe you had a business deal go bad, and that guy or that lady, maybe, maybe you were molested. Maybe you were raped. I, there's sin in the world, and bad stuff happens. 1 Timothy 2.4, Paul says, quoting God, he says that God not only wants us, but everyone to be saved. And as, as we come to the close tonight, I want to open up the altars because I, I believe it's important that some things we spend significant time with and some things we spend focused time with it's not that you can't pray in your seat. You can. It's not that you can't pray in the car on the way home with four kids in the back seat. You can. There's a difference. Focus time at the altar where there's nothing else distracting you. It's you and the Holy Spirit. So I just want to open this. The altars will be open, but here's, I'm just going to, three things I'd like for you to consider and invite you to come forward. The first is, do you need some amazing grace for yourself? Do you feel like you need to be worthy? That you've not done it right? That somehow you're outside of this whole thing and that you don't get it or you've not done it right? God wants to let you know tonight that you're forgiven that you're loved, that you're accepted. Second group, if there's someone in your life that you're afraid to pray for, or maybe that you've given up because you're just not sure that it's gonna happen. You stopped because there was no hope. Jonah knew that that is not true. The Ninevites, deserved it in every way and God is sheer grace and sheer mercy ready at the drop of a hat to forgive don't stop praying and then the toughest would be who do you have in your life that you need amazing grace to give grace to. You don't think they're worthy. And maybe they're not. Maybe they've never asked for forgiveness. Maybe they're never going to. But let me tell you, unforgiveness eats you up, not them. Unforgiveness will ruin your life. And the Lord says, forgive as you have been forgiven. I'm not saying it's easy but it's necessary for you and your relationship with the Lord. If you finished, if, you rem if you've remembered by this time the story of Jonah, you know how Jonah finished. He was mad. He wanted Nineveh destroyed. And I would just warn you, don't go down that road. <laughs>